I'm going to start with a, with a big thank you to, to the two, Gilles and to Fernando, for having organized this conference. Uh, this certainly means a lot to me. Um, I, was a, I was a student of Nigel, and, and I miss him a lot. And, um, and I think this conference was very much needed, both for scientific and non-scientific reasons. And I'm very grateful that uh, you have made it a reality. So thanks for that. So uh, my talk today um, is about some more philosophical question that Nigel mentioned to me in, in 2006. And it's the question of finding out what's the right level of generality to study h infinity functional calculus in the sense that Lutz just uh, presented, uh, but for differential operators. And, uh, and what he meant by that question is that, you know, I mean, that question was motivated by the fact that, at that time, uh, two types of results were appearing. On the one hand, perturbation results at the general operator theoretic level, uh, some by Nigel just on his own, some with uh, Lutz and, and Per Kunzmann. And the message of these results somehow was that the functional calculus is very unstable on the perturbation. When I mean, you have some positive results, but you change the assumption a little bit and things start failing. And on the other hand, you had results in more specific cases of differential operators, results uh, by people like Alan McIntosh, Steve Hoffman, many others, coming from uh, harmonic analysis of PDE. And these results were sending the opposite message, that the functional calculus of these operators, at least, was very stable on the perturbation. So uh, that's a bit frustrating. You want to know why there is such a gap. Uh, and so what Nigel was suggesting is, was to try to do something a little bit in between, maybe less general than what he was doing with Lutz, uh, but in the meantime, more general than what people were doing uh, coming from harmonic analysis of PD. And some of that's what I've been trying to do ever since, sort of wiggling towards more abstraction from the harmonic analysis side and trying to go closer to the differential operators from the pure operator theoretic side. So what I want to present today uh, is a paper we finished last year with Dorothy Frey and Alan McIntosh. It's about perturbation of differential operators in LP. uses very much um, real variable harmonic analytic techniques. But I want to look at it from a pure operator theoretic perspective, try to find out, try. I don't think I'm going to succeed, but explain maybe how this proof works from a distance, from an operator theoretic perspective. OK, so let me uh, set the scene. The infinity calculus, you, you've heard about it already. Uh, but let's try and look at it the way Nigel used to. So uh, take a Vanak space. Uh, I'm going to be dealing with uh, bisectorial operators. Uh, it's almost the same as the sectorial case. So these are operators that have their spectrum in a bisector of the complex plane. And outside of a slightly bigger bisector, you have uniform bounds. So that's what I call the bisector. And outside of the slightly bigger bisector, you get uniform bounds on the resolvents. I'll give you examples in a minute. And for such operators, you can start defining a functional calculus for bounded holomorphic functions, at least when the functions have enough decay at zero and infinity to make sense of a Cauchy integral going around the spectrum on the boundary of an even slightly bigger bisector. So, all right, this. obviously makes sense as long as my phi, my psi uh, makes this integral is such that this integral is absolutely converging. Right, so you can define a functional calculus uh, 
as in the Dunford calculus for bounded operators, uh, in that way, at least for functions that are that nice, and then you want to know whether you can extend it from that to all the uh, algebra of bounded holomorphic functions. So the definition of the operator having a bounded h-infinity functional calculus, and that's too long to say, so I'm just going to say has h-infinity, I mean as a bounded holomorphic functional calculus, um, if, if these operators, which are well defined, have a norm which only depends on the h-infinity norm of the function psi. So if the following holds. D-line are missing. Oh, by the way, by this I always mean inequality up to a constant that doesn't depend on anything important. All right, so Nigel used to say, ah, oh, well, the theory of HFT functional calculus is just the theory of basis in Banach spaces all over again. So in particular, I was saying, well, this is an unconditionality property uh, for the operator. So what does that mean? I mean, well, it's sort of obviously an unconditionality property if you look at it in this way. I mean, somehow, okay, if this doesn't quite make sense to talk about this integral as being a decomposition of the identity, but if you think of it you know, as the identity being plugging the function psi equal to 1, you should think about that as being a decomposition continuous decomposition, not quite a decomposition into a basis, but that's a similar sort of thing, and you're wondering whether you can pull out these scalar values psi of lambda, just a soup norm. So really you're asking whether a certain decomposition associated with the operator is unconditional or not. And that's what this is about. And we'll see another way of thinking about this as an unconditional pro unconditionality property in just a second. Now, why is it fair to say that as soon as you have that, you have a bounded h infinity functional calculus? Because somewhere at the very beginning of the theory, one proves a so-called convergence lemma that goes back to Alan McIntosh in the 80s that tells you that if you have these bounds, then you're going to be able to take to extend your functional calculus to all the bounded holomorphic functions. You will approximate bounded holomorphic functions by functions with nice decay, uh, you know, in uh, uniform ways on compact sets, and then show that the corresponding operators' sequences converge in the strong operator topology. That's the idea. All right, so, okay, this is the story, and I should tell you what the basic examples are. Get a good feel for what this calculus is about. So the first example, uh, one could think of, if one comes from Banach space theory, uh, is just a multiplier on a Schauder basis. So if you have a Schauder basis in your Banach space, and you look at an operator, which is diagonal with respect to that basis, and let's say multiply by 2 to the n, uh, and it's easy to see that this operator will have an h infinity functional calculus if and only if the basis is unconditional. Okay. One direction is trivial. I mean, if your basis is unconditional, your functional calculus psi of d will be multiplication by psi of the 2n. Your basis is unconditional. You can control that, taking out the soup of the psi of the 2n. Uh, the other direction is not as obvious, but you've got a theorem called uh, Carlson interpolation theorem that tells you that because of the lacunarity of that sequence, given any choices of signs, you can fit in an holomorphic function which is going to take these values of plus or minus 1 at points 2 to the n. So if you had an HFE functional calculus, then you could plug in any possible choices of sign. Therefore, your basis would have to be unconditional. Right? So that's a fundamental example, and you should think maybe we're trying to understand a version of that for operators that may not be multipliers on a basis. But this is like the property of unconditionality for a basis. So that's uh, 
maybe the first example that uh, Nigel would have thought about. Uh, I suppose the first example that people coming from uh, Harmony Canals as a PDE background will think about is differentiation, an LP of R or LP of the circle. Uh, so if you look at EN being the trigonometric basis on LP of the circle, and you take D to be, okay, minus I times differentiation, that's multiplication by N on the Fourier side. Uh, okay, well, this operator is a typical example of an operator that does have an H infinity functional calculus, despite the fact that the trigonometric basis is not an unconditional basis of LP if P is not two. So, okay, that is the first basic uh, discrepancy that I want to talk about in, 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 this, uh, in this talk, right? I mean, for this multiplier, the question of whether or not you have an holomorphic functional calculus is really just the question of whether or not this basis is unconditional. But when you start dealing with differential operators, you may very well have a functional calculus without having an unconditional basis. Right? So there's something a little bit more subtle happening here. And we'll see that what makes this possible is the fact that the, when you do a block base with using dyadic blocks, that charter decomposition is unconditional. Okay. Now, the way to think about holomorphic functional calculus, as, uh, as Lutz uh, uh, clearly pointed out, is it's a generalization of what we do in harmonic analysis with Fourier multipliers. So, this is Fourier multipliers, and you want to go beyond Fourier multipliers, and holomorphic functional calculus is going to be used as a generalization of that. And in which directions can you generalize? Well, if you come from Banach's bit theory, you may think, well, this is just one possible basis, and I can go to all sorts of other bases. And if you come from harmonic analysis, you're going to say, well, my next stage after Fourier multipliers is pseudo-differential operators, Fourier integral operators, and start building up in difficulty in that way. And if you come from PDE, you're going to think, well, basic things are constant coefficient differential operators, and I'm going to try to move to variable coefficients. And this is a similar procedure, but I think one of the message of today is that if you make the jump all the way to any possible shadow basis, well, you've gone too far <laughs> in abstraction, and your theorems are necessarily going to be limited. Uh, and I think maybe it's because there's a lot of shadow basis out there. <laughs> God knows that they can have a, a wild behavior, even on an LP space, they have not, not necessarily anything to do with the underlying uh, measure space. Well, if God didn't know that, then I'm sure Nigel has told him by now. Okay, so perturbation result. All right, so. so the question is a very natural question in operator theory. Start with an operator that has a bounded holomorphic functional calculus. Take a bounded operator and try and find conditions on this bounded operator such that the product D times B still has an H infinity functional calculus. Maybe, you know, for B, a small perturbation of the identity in various sense, you sort of hope that this is going to happen. Now, one theorem that Nigel got uh, on this question, 2007, uh, is the following. So, that's in a Hilbert space. He also has, it, obviously, results outside of the Hilbert space setting, but I'm just going to formulate it. In that case, uh, so work in a Hilbert space, Let's say that you take an orthonormal basis and a multiplicator, a multiplier operator with uh, multiplying by 2 to the n. Uh, and now there's a positive result for compact perturbations of the identity that looks like this. If you take a compact operator, uh, and if you happen to know that the singular values of that operator divided by n are summable, then 
d times 1 plus the compact will still have an holomorphic functional calculus. So you can do perturbations by 1 plus a compact as long as your compact operator satisfies these assumptions. And you won't be too surprised when I tell you that, of course, Nigel doesn't put any assumption on anything without checking that this is actually optimal. Uh, so it is, uh, in a sense. Uh, there exists a compact operator such that for any epsilon, d times 1 plus epsilon k does not have h infinity. So I see that. That's pretty bad news, right? Just compact perturbations, even as small as you want, well, compact perturbation of the identity may already be problematic. OK, I mean, you know, you could say that's a mild condition, but still, naively, you would have hoped for this to be good enough, and that's not. Um, that's just on a Hilbert space. There's variance of that on Banach spaces. Um, and I should say, I'm not going to mention them here, so I'm going to run out of time, but um, uh, also uh, Nigel, together with, with Lutz and with Per Kunzmann, had all sort of other perturbation results where you ask for the perturbation not to be like 1 plus a compact, but 1 plus something which is small in a way related to your operator D. Right? Semi-group theory, we're very much used to have this sort of things. If you have a small, uh, a D small perturbation, that should be good enough. And again, that's not good enough. You need further assumption depending on fractional powers of your operator D. And now, if you look at it from a PDE perspective, this is a little bit annoying because this is going to force things like Elder continuous coefficients, things like that. Uh, and we already know that far better results are possible in PDE. So let me mention one of these. Oh, I forgot that I had fancy technology at my disposal. All right. OK. So that's uh, perturbation results at the level of general sectoral operators. Now let me give you a result at the level of differential operators. So this one is due to Axelson, Keys, and Macintosh. in 2006, and now it deals with things that are a, a lot more concrete. So x is going to be of that form. And my operator d is going to be of this form. Uh, I've got two components of functions and vector fields. It acts as a gradient on functions and as a divergence on vector fields. Uh, I'm going to have a, an operator T, which is a multiplication operator by a matrix-valued L infinity function. And my operator B is going to be this operator matrix. And now their result tells you that if you look at a perturbation d times b, uh, perturbation of d, in that way, OK, well, you know, it, it may not even be bisectorial. Of course, you need some ellipticity assumption on this matrix to make it bisectorial. But as soon as it is bisectorial, it does have an h-infinity functional calculus. Right? So you can afford any bounded perturbation you want, not even small. All right. Now, why do people care about this sort of results? Uh, let me just mention one corollary. OK, so this is a constant coefficient differential operator. And I'm doing a perturbation that turns it into a differential operator with very rough coefficients, just bounded measurable. 
And there's plenty of consequences of the fact that all of these guys are going to have an holomorphic functional calculus. One of these consequences is that, well, I can plug in any bounded holomorphic function. In particular, I could take a function which is constant equal to plus 1 on the right and minus 1 on the left. And that's going to tell me that the square root of db squared behaves exactly like db. For all u in L2. Uh, and if you chase down what db is and what db square is, you will realize, if I start boring you, just do this multiplication of two by two matrices, it's, it's, um, uh, you know, you learn something in the process, I suppose. And um, that tells you exactly that the square root of the second order elliptic operator dv grad behaves exactly like the gradient. Uh, and that's a result that people had been chasing for 40 years in harmonic analysis. It's called the Cato square root estimates. Cato had conjectured these inequalities uh, back in 1961. Uh, it was already a big deal when uh, Kaufmann, Macintosh, and Meyer in '84 managed to do the one dimensional solution of that, uh, which you can see as the boundaries of the Cauchy integral on Lipschitz curves. Uh, and if it, it took all the way to 2002 and a whole development of what's called T of 1 and T of B theorems to finally prove these estimates. There was Osher, Hoffman, Lacey, Macintosh, and Chamichon in 2002. Uh, and, okay, this carries a lot of meaning for PDE purposes. I mean, it really tells you that it doesn't matter how rough your coefficients are, all these operators all have the same maximal domain, which is just W12. So. It's one of the things we're aiming for. All right, so this is the discrepancy I was talking about. General operator theoretic perturbation, things get very tricky very quickly, very unstable. Perturbation of very concrete operators, you can do whatever you want. All right, so tr let's try and understand so I'm going to present basically the scheme of the proof of results of that nature, but try and tell you, you know, take a bit of distance and tell you why they work somehow. So I'm not going to present the Axis and Keith Macintosh results. Uh, I'm going to present an LP version that we've got. So uh, first ver LP version of that. Uh, we got together with uh, Thomas Uton and Alan McIntosh uh, in 2008. Uh, and what we got at that time, so same operators, but take the LP version. P strictly between 1 and infinity. Uh, and the theorem we had was that Okay, theme of the morning and also of a large part of the afternoon. Put an R in front of that. Uh, you have an H infinity functional calculus as soon as dB is not just bisectorial in LP but R bisectorial, and that really means that instead of these uniform estimates, I have an R bound. All right, but I'm not really going to be talking about this result. I'm going to be talking about uh, a new version, which we got uh, last year with Dorothy Frey and Alan McIntosh. And the same result was obtained independently by Pascal Ocher and Sebastian Stahlhut also last year. So I'll tell you a bit of a story here. Uh, and the result says, OK, one part of the result, the one that I'm going to be describing today, says that you can remove the R. So for these operators in LP, same story as in L2. As soon as you're bisectorial, you do have an H infinity functional calculus. OK, so that's the theorem I want to tell you about. <coughs> 
Uh, yeah, so the, a bit of a story on that. This is fairly, uh, uh, I don't know, humiliating, maybe I should say as a word. I mean, while we were working on this for the last two years or so, Alan was also working with Pascal on certain projects, and I was also working with Pascal on certain projects, and we were all talking to each other, and we didn't even realize that we were trying to prove the same thing on yet another project. So it's a bit bizarre, uh, but that's because we were coming at it from a very different perspective. So the Osher Stalhut proof actually uses the paper that we had with Thomas and Alan back in 2008. So it uses that as a starting point, as a black box, and then it builds from there and removes the R and actually proves a little bit more. Uh, and I'll tell you exactly what in the course of this talk, something called a conical square function estimate, uh, which then can be fed into boundary value problems on Lipschitz domains. So, you know, they didn't want to redo what was there, they wanted to use it and improve it for, to meet their needs in boundary value problems. Now, we, we were coming from a very different perspective. We had realized that conical square function estimates, and I'll tell you what that is, uh, would be an interesting perspective to give a different proof of that, which would not require our boundedness, and we'd, which also prove a little bit more and prove the type of estimates you need in these elliptic problems. So we're sort of looking at it from a very different perspective. We're trying to have a completely different approach. They were trying to use it and push it a bit further. All right? So, you know, if you don't care what's in your toolbox and you really want to get to the PDE, then you can go to their paper. If you don't want to read this paper <laughs> and you want a self-contained approach, then that's what we're doing here. All right, so I want to tell you about this and the methods that we use. Okay, so the starting point is going to be something that we've already heard about a fair bit this morning, uh, but I'm going to look at a very simple version thereof, and that's the idea of a square function. All right, how do you prove that you have a bounded holomorphic functional calculus? Okay, for a simple enough operator, multipli a multiplier on a basis, you know, maybe you can just prove this directly. Now, in practice, that doesn't happen that often, and you're going to prove something else. You're gonna prove a square function estimate. So there's a theorem, I'm just gonna mention the LP version. Uh, which goes back to Cowling, Dost, Macintosh, and Yagi in 96. You've seen the full-blown Banach space version in Lutz talk. Uh, it was generalized by them in 2001. Uh, but just in LP, an operator D has an H-infinity calculus if and only if you have the following square function estimate. For all u in LP, where q, uh, it's my favorite function for these things, but you have a bit of freedom anyway uh, in how you choose it, it's z over 1 plus z squared. Right. So, you, know, you can prove a uniform bound for every possible psi function, or alternatively, you can prove a bit more than a uniform bound. You can prove a square function bound, but just for one function psi, right? which is this function Q I've chosen. So really, at the end of the day, uh, when we prove perturbation results, or when we prove that certain concrete operators, like all the examples that Lutz mentioned in his talk, have an HV functional calculus, that's what we prove. We prove a square function estimate. If you come from harmonic analysis, you think this is very good chances to work because very often you have, you know, when you have a bounded operator in some LP space, it actually improves to being a bounded operator on LP with value in L2. So, so often, you know, with Fourier multiplier theorems and things like that, 
you know, proving that is not much harder than proving just a uniform bound for that one function. Okay. Now, let's try and understand what these things mean. So first of all, I should say this is the continuous square function, but you can also look at a discrete version. All right, so what do these things mean? Well, first way of thinking about this, which is very much the way Nigel used to teach that, is to think of unconditional block bases. So let's go back to uh, uh, my favorite example, differentiation. So, okay, for that one, what does the square function estimate, uh, what is the square function estimate trying to tell you? Uh, well, I mean, this is a Fourier multiplier, and what it does is that it multiplies your Fourier coefficients by 2kn divided by 1 plus 2kn squared. All right? So, uh, you know, if 2kn is very small, then this is very small. And if 2kn is very large, then this is very large. So this is basically 1 when n is of the order of 2 minus k. And as soon as you move away from that, it decays. Not very fast, but OK. There's games you can play. You can show that you, know, you can move from that square function to a square function that would involve, say, powers of that. So you can make the decay faster if you need it. Um, because of that, it takes a bit of work, but you can prove that the square function estimate is going to hold if and only if a similar estimate holds where instead of this thing, which is basically 1 when n is roughly 2 to the minus k and then decays, you take a sharp cutoff, yeah, just the characteristic functions of the sets of those n that are roughly 2 to the k. So the square function estimate, the way you should think about it, all right, this happens, this happens because that happens. And the key part of proving that estimate is this. Which is just a way of saying, fair enough, the trigonometric basis is not unconditional, but the dyadic blocking of that basis is an unconditional, I mean, gives an unconditional shadow decomposition. So you should think about this sort of square function estimates, or gamma norms estimates, these sort of things we try to prove in holomorphic functional calculus theory as analogs of this uh, phenomenon from basis theory. So that's a very powerful way of thinking about all of this. Right? You have an operator on a Banach space. You create a decomposition which mimics the behavior of a basis but is adapted to the operator. And you ask whether it's unconditional or not, or at least whether an appropriate blocking thereof is unconditional. It is very powerful. All right, so that's a very powerful perspective. But there's another perspective that people from, from PD and harmonic analysis would prefer. And that is very important to keep in mind when you're going to deal with differential operators. That's a PDE perspective. So this sort of square function estimates, people in, in PDE see them all the time, and they certainly don't think about them as being unconditional blockings property. They think about them as being a relationship between data and solution. So if I just look at the standard heat equation, 
well, P of Rn, right? There's, well, there's many things you can say about the solution to that equation. But one thing you can say is that the LP norm of the data is equivalent to these square function norms for the gradient of the solution. It's one of the things you can prove. You can prove it by hand using the heat kernel if you want to. Um, but this is quite deep. I mean, this, this is something you can then use to solve nonlinear problems. And, and this really gives a, a sharp relationship between the properties of the solution and the properties of the data. Right? And that's very much an inequality of that nature. So you could say, OK, people in PDE get that because the Laplacian has an HMVT functional calculus. That's one way to look at it, plus boundedness of risk transforms. Or alternatively, because the operator D up there has an HMVT functional calculus. So sure, you can say that, but this sort of estimates, they go beyond functional calculus. I mean, you see them in PDE, let's say, for non-autonomous problems. So it's not about the functional calculus of one operator. It's something about a family of operators. You see them on nonlinear problems. You see them everywhere. I mean, there's something that goes beyond functional calculus. So, right. So there's something here which tells you that with differential operators, something is more going to happen than with general sectoral operators. Well, because there's an underlying PDE, and the underlying PDE will see a relationship between the time variable and the space variable. If it's a parabolic problem, you're going to see some form of diffusion. If it's a wave equation, you're going to see some propagation. If it's a Schrodinger equation, you're going to see some dispersion, whatever. But there's going to be some relationship between time and space. So here, when you prove such a square function estimate, you're really saying the properties of this operator are some unconditional the decomposition into some kind of a basis of eigenfunction is, is related to the equation dTU equal du. But of course, if you take any possible shadow basis, there's no reason why this decomposition should have anything to do with the behavior of the corresponding differential equation, dTU equal du. And that's why it's easy to build all sort of operators that don't have an holomorphic functional calculus. But if your operator happens to be a differential operator, then your decomposition is immediately tied up with a space variable and a time variable, and there's a relationship between the two, and that makes this sort of estimate more plausible, easier to happen. Right? I mean, think about that. You know, the, the decomposition, you know, this little with Pele types decomposition on the space of data, this is a frequency decomposition. Of course, frequency is related to time. <laughs> it's related to the behavior of the solution of the corresponding PDE. So I think that's the first step, thinking about it in that way, thinking that what really matters in HMT functional calculus is not so much the functional calculus per se, the fact that you have an algebra homomorphism between this algebra of function, this algebra of operators. Uh, what really matters is the square function. And, you, and that can happen. If, you know, beyond the case of just functional calculus of one operator. And this is very much tied up with very fundamental PDE ideas of relationship between space and time. So how do we express these ideas and how do we use them is what I want to get to next. So if you start digging into the proof of diagonal, uh, into the proof of square function estimates and functional calculus for differential operators, uh, basically, there's a version of the following property that always going to pop up. So I'm going to try and express that in as much of an operator theoretic way as I can. And that's what we call no L2, L2 of diagonal bounds. So I'm saying that a family of operators has L2, L2 of diagonal bounds if, on Rn, if whenever I take two Borel uh, subsets of Rn. Okay, I'm going to do it for every order, every time, every u in L2. I've got the following property. 
So this property is a way to capture, as Nigel was suggesting we should do, uh, as a way to capture the fact that one well, of my operators to start with was a mix of differentiation and multiplication. And therefore, its resolvents have a way of talking to multiplications by cutoff functions. And fundamentally, because there's PD involved in there, and PD of a parabolic type is what I have in mind, uh, there's going to be some form of diffusion. What this inequality is telling you is that if you start with, let's say, heat uh, somewhere on a set F, and, okay, right now, just forget this function Q and just think of a heat semigroup. And then you're looking at what happens on a set E after time T, then you're able to measure how much heat has been transferred from F to E. I mean, very often, if I have a semigroup in here, what you actually expect is an exponential of minus distance to E to the F squared divided by T, just like you would have in a classical heat semigroup. So this property, if you start digging, you'll see that a version of that is what we use everywhere. Now, very often, definitely if you go back more than 10 years, you wouldn't see this property. You would see something more specific, something about heat kernel bounds. The fact that your operators have certain representation as integral operators and that you have some pointwise bound on the kernel and you exploit that. Now, that's actually an integrated version of heat kernel bounds. And that's a version which A is enough in all the theorems, all these techniques that I want to talk about in five minutes. Um, and B is much easier to actually prove in practice. So the thing is that point towards heat kernels bound, that's something which is too specific. You move from equations to system, you start going to rough coefficients or rough boundaries of domain, and you lose these, these nice representations with heat kernels, but you basically never lose that. What I mean by that is that as soon as you have an operator D, say that generates a group on L2, and you have some commutators estimates on that, which would follow from having, say, a product rule for your differentiation, uh, then you're going to have that. That's actually proven in a paper by McIntosh and Morris a couple of years ago. And you can also prove that this happens if and only if the corresponding wave equation has finite speed of propagation. It's also a very natural property. So as soon as you start dealing with something that looks like a vaguely reasonable PD, you have that, that operator theoretic property re relating the resolvent of your operators and multiplication by cutoff, and then you're in business to do the sort of things we do. And what are the sort of things we do? So we do T of B theorems. So the idea is when you deal with differential operators, there's a, there's a general thing that tends to happen, uh, which is extremely helpful, is that to test the boundedness of your operator on L2, LP, or all sort of function spaces, you only have to test your operator on one function. And he, like, you just, T of 1 theorem, you test it on a constant function. T of B theorem, you manufacture a function B that you like, and then you test it on that function. And if that belongs to the appropriate space, then your operator T is LP bounded. So, you know, this is something that make proving boundedness of op operators in the functional calculus of the differential operators. It's not easier, I would say, but I mean, you know, so much more, you may have so much more powerful results because you have such a uh, incredible testing criterion. But how do these theorems work? Well, when you start looking into them, basically they do the following thing, which we call reduction to a principal part. They do it with the perturbed one. Basically, you show that the resolvent of your operator, for all practical purposes, behave like something that has a very simple structure. A multiplication operator times an averaging operator. So AT in here is, let's say, an averaging operator which is averaging over the dyadic cube, you fix the family of dyadic cubes, of side lengths roughly t containing the point x. 
and gamma TB is a multiplication operator, matrix valued, it's acting on a vector in C to the n plus 1 by applying the resolvent of the differential operator to the constant function equal to omega. Okay, it's not clear you can do that, but actually you can show that the resolvents map L infinity to L2 log, so this is well defined. So the moral of the theorems is that you end up showing that this can be controlled in various norms, all sorts of square function norms. Right. So the resolvent of differential operators uh, you know, you can say a lot more about them than you would be able to say about the resolvent of a general sectoral operator. Essentially, from the h and functional calculus perspective, you don't really have to understand these things, you only have to understand these ones. Multiplications times averaging. So really, it says that your function, when you're working at scale t, you can forget what it is, really. You take the ID cubes, you replace it by its average on every ID cube, and then these operators QTB just act as multiplication on all of these constants. Right. Now, of course, that's once you realize that there is this philosophy behind what we do, you start seeing why we can prove better perturbation results, right? Because it's just about checking that these multiplication operators cannot vary too much. All right, so here is the general scheme of what we do. So you exploit L2, L2 of the angle bounds. So first of all, for the operators that you are dealing with, you prove the L2, L2 of the angle bounds. And as I say, this is something which is very easy, generally speaking. Once you have them, you can use them to prove a T of B type theorem. Right? If you start digging into T of B theorem, you realize fundamentally what we exploit are these off the angle bounds. OK, more often than not, we have pointwise heat kernel bounds, and that's what we use, but actually you can do it in a much softer way. And that allows you to reduce your problem to these multiplication times averaging operators. Right? That's all you need to look at. Okay, well, how would you prove a square function for these guys? Ah, well, then, that's a very natural question in harmonic analysis. You have this sort of product, and there's something called Carlson inequality that comes in. I'll tell you what that is in just a second. And Carlson inequality tells you you can control square function norms of that as soon as you can show that gamma t b x squared dx dt of a t is a Carlson measure. So this, you know. L2 of the angle bounds allow you to reduce to this problem of multiplication times averaging. Carlson inequality reduces the problem to the multiplication part giving rise to a Carlson measure. Or in other words, T of 1 is in BMO. And how do you prove that? That's a long story. It's quite difficult. But the key ingredient is yet again L2 of the angle bounds. You use that to study this going back to basic properties of your operators, the bisectoriality, and you establish that it's a Carlson measure. And that gives you the square function estimate and ends the functional calculus. Right. So that's the scheme of the proof, generally speaking. Uh, OK. The thing is, in which norms? And in the axelson kiss mackintosh paper, this is standard Hilbert and square functions. L2 is value in L2. In the paper with Chomas and Alan, we use the, this sort of square function, which we call vertical square function, in LP. And that causes a lot of trouble. And in this new approach, we use different square functions, conical square functions, something in terms of what is called 10 space norms. And that actually helps with a lot of uh, the theory. And it's much more natural from the point of view of differential operators. That's the final message that I want to get to. So do I have another five minutes? Four. Four. I can do with four. All right. So here's the final message. <laughs>
Okay, so Carlson inequalities. What? Six, seven. How do we deal with these operators and reduce things to just a problem about a scalar quantity? Um, okay, Carlson, 1962, proved the following inequality. Prove more than that, but I'm just going to express it in that way. If you look at that in L2 of both the space and the time variable, this is controlled by the L2 norm of u times the norm of this as a Carlson measure. All right? That's the result about L2 square functions. That's, the way, that's one way to look at it. Now, how would you do this in LP? Right. Well, having a version of that for LP square function was a large part of the work we did with Thomas and Allen. And uh, that was not easy. And I'm not going to talk about it because in the new approach where we use 10 spaces, we have a far more, well, I don't know about far more natural, <laughs> but we have a version of uh, Carlson inequality that has always been around, and that's called factorization of 10 spaces. Goes back to Kaufmann, Meyer, and Stein in the basic form that we apply. But the best way to understand that is to read and to see Really, the, the full picture is to read a paper by Cohn and Verbitsky in 2000, uh, based on earlier work of uh, Amar and Bonami. And what this is saying is that when you try to control this sort of operators that are of the form multiplication times averaging in a certain square function norm, which is called the TP2 norm, then Oh well, here is the answer. TP2 is TP infinity times T infinity 2. That's the factorization. Um, so it tells you for a product, you can control the product by the TP infinity to TP infinity norm of ETAUX. I'm running out of time, so I'm starting to be sloppy with my notation. Uh, that's just the non tangential maximal function of U in LP, which is LP bounded, uh, times. this norm in t infinity 2, which is exactly that quantity, the norm of gamma t b x squared dx dt over t as a Carlson measure. So that tells you something. Uh, that tells you that if you're willing to use these spaces for your square function, and I'll write down the definition in just a second, then your whole problem in LP reduces to this same Carlson measure estimate as you had in L2. Right. Now, that doesn't mean that, the, that you have a functional calculus on all LP. There's something else happening here, but I'm not going to talk about that now. I'm just going to finish up with, uh, by writing up the definition of 10 spaces and just finish professing my unconditional love for these spaces. I hated them at first, you know, like that's, that's deep love, because I, I moved from hate to unconditional love. Um, <laughs> this is going nowhere. OK, um, 10 spaces. The 10 space norm, it's a square function norm, which is It has just a little twist compared to the standard square function norm that we had been talking about uh, all of this morning. The additional twist is that we do an extra averaging in space. Uh, there's a one over p, yeah, thank you. Right, and that changes a lot of things, and I won't have time to explain that. We can chat over lunch if you want to hear more about my unconditional love for 10 spaces. Uh, but I'll just tell you this. This is just so beautifully natural when we deal with differential operators. And here is why. One thing, if I have bounded operators on L2, 
and I try to pull them out out of a square function norm. Can I do this? What do I need to know on my operators to do that? Well, if I didn't have this extra averaging, if it was a square, standard square function norm, then well, uh, both uh, uh, Mark and Lutz gave you the answer. This is Carlton Weiss multiplier theorem. This happens if and only if the family is R bounded on LP. But if you're changing from vertical to conical square function, then it's not R boundedness you need. It's L2, L2 of diagonal bounds. Now, R boundedness used to be, and this sort of thing is an assumption we needed to do anything. Here, L2, L2 of diagonal bounds, this is not an assumption. This is something we can prove all the time. So that makes manipulating these square functions somewhat substantially nicer than the standard ones. Now, of course, this is no chance to happen for an abstract operator. I mean, this has to do with the differential operator nature. But still, it's still good enough to prove functional calculus. If you prove this, then D has an H infinity functional calculus. But it's not an if and only if anymore. You're proving something slightly stronger, and that's what Osher and Stahlhult were after, because this slightly stronger thing you prove is exactly what you need uh, when solving differential equation. I have one more line. Okay. <laughs> Just one more that I need to put in. Uh, and that's very handy and very natural again, because this connects the whole thing with the theory of Hardy spaces. If I go back and look at the heat equation, but this one, this time with an initial data in H1, the relationship that I had on the board before between data and solution is no involving 10 spaces, right? Gradient of the solution to the heat equation in T12, that's an equivalent norm to the H1 norm of the data. And that brings in a whole world of techniques, including calton metria interpolation results on scales of quasi-Banach spaces, because then you start going on TP2, P less than 1, and Renstein interpolation arguments. I'll stop here. Thanks for your attention. Are there any questions or comments for Pierre? If so, I'll pass the microphone to you. Uh, now, you assume that L2, L2 of diagonal bounds. So how far are they uh, in this context from the, <clears throat> I mean, if you have LP, LQ of diagonal bounds, you also get <coughs> R sectoriality by these papers by Brunk and yeah. Kunzmann that also use these off diagonal bounds. So <clears throat> in this concrete situations, how far are you from that slightly stronger off diagonal bounds? So there's quite a lot of things we can do just under L2, L2. And L2, L2 is, as I said, easy to get. All right. Now, what you're pointing out is that very often we actually get stronger results by ask, having something stronger than L2, L2, which is an LP, L2 of diagonal bound. Now, if you go all the way to an L1, L2 of diagonal bounds, then this is like pointwise heat kernel bounds. But things interpolate in between. And it's true that there is a, a bit of a gray area here that once you start assuming L, if you just assume L2, L2, you know, and you really, you know, you really have a theorem that works all the time. Uh, if you assume L1, L2, then it's very much restricted to smooth enough coefficients, equations in other systems, things like that. If you assume LP, L2, then uh, it's not clear how far you are from other things that are that can be done by other methods because, as you said, you can bootstrap from that, reprove some R bisectoriality in between. Um, what happens is that, in particular, in that paper that we have with Dorothea and Alan, we we well, we do have the L2 L2 of diagonal bounds, but we also have some LP L2 of diagonal bounds that we establish. I mean, it has to be because at the end of the day, you know, <laughs> you prove that you have an HP functional calculus. So in particular, you are bisectorial, right? But, okay, the true story is that the theorem goes beyond that, and you can have restricted functional calculus on parts of your space. And that's sort of 
you know, disconnected from this bisectorality business. But I should say, okay, I could, <laughs> I'm just going to say on that. I mean, you could, am I saying, I mean, Mark did the rise of our boundaries. Am I talking about the fall? I am not. Uh, you know, we sort of, sort of, I mean, we sort of sort in that way a little bit. We sort of think, okay, when we restrict our attention to differential operators, maybe the moral of what has been happening over the last five years or so is that wherever you see R boundedness, you start putting L2, L2 of diagonal bounds. Wherever we had gamma norms, you put 10 space norms, and, and that's what we do. But not quite, because the sort of things we use on 10 spaces, actually, uh, there's a lot to gain by looking at them as gamma norms, not something we did with Thomas and Jan. Uh, and also, deep in the proof, our boundedness just comes back here and there. So it, it hasn't disappeared at all. And, well, beautiful, you mentioned that Kalton and Wojtacek proved that T12 is isomorphic to rad of H1, space of Hadamard sequences over H1. So the Hadamard certainly haven't disappeared. I don't have any philosophical insight on what's there, uh, what Carlton and Wojtacek were doing was proving that you cannot have a non-atomic lattice structure on H1. Looks like a different philosophy, but Meyer will start his book on Wavelet telling you that Moray's proof of an unconditional basis of H1 is the start of Wavelet theory. So, okay. <laughs> There's something here that I just don't understand. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, so lunchtime and we resume at 2 o'clock? 2 o'clock. See you. Bon appetit, though.